Looking at the Earth from space is amazing. The splendor it reveals is something our ancient ancestors could only have imagined. Secular scientists say that our majestic home planet, with all of its apparent design features to support life, formed by natural processes from a gas cloud billions of years ago. But despite these claims, there is abundant evidence that the Earth is unique, young, and finely tuned by its creator. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Our Designed Earth with Spike Pissaris. Hello, welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. We have an interesting show for you today. Our guest, Spike Pissaris, has a degree in electrical engineering and has done graduate work in physics. He was formerly an engineer in the United States military space program. He is an author and popular speaker on astronomy and related topics. Spike founded Creation Astronomy and has produced many fascinating videos defending a young Earth view as related in the Bible. Welcome to the program, Spike. Thanks for having me, Ray. So we're going to be talking about our designed Earth. Emphasis on designed, yes. So where are you going to take us to begin? Well, we're going to look at what Scripture says about our home planet and compare that to what secular scientists say about where it came from and see which of those two views matches the evidence better. Because Scripture says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Familiar verse to most of us, I would assume. Uh, but of course, the secular view doesn't accept that. The secular view says it all formed by itself by natural processes over long periods of time. Well, if the secular view were correct, what would that then imply about what we should see in the earth and uh, our overall environment? Well, applying these thoughts to the earth, we can ask the question by looking at various features of it. Does this look like it's random, like it's just the outcome of natural processes acting on their own? Or does it look like it was designed and finely tuned to support life on Earth, as the Bible would say? And that's interesting for us because we know what design is. We're human beings. We, you know, we have these design computers. Sure. No one would ever think that this computer formed itself randomly sure. over time. And so we should be able to take that same idea and apply it to creation. Absolutely. So one of the most noticeable features of our planet when you see it from space is that it's covered with water. 70% of the surface of the Earth is covered with it. Now that's interesting from an origins perspective because the secular model says that the solar system came from a solar nebula, a large cloud of gas billions of years ago. That swirled and did various things and eventually that's where the planets formed from. So the model would predict then that the Earth should have formed with no water at all. Of course, that's not what we see. Our planet, as we said, is covered with the stuff. So how do secular scientists account for this very noticeable feature of our planet? Well, there used to be something called the late veneer hypothesis that comets supplied Earth's water. Now, comets are largely dirty snowballs in space. They're mostly water. So they said, well, it seems reasonable that if a sufficient number of comets bombarded the Earth early in its history, maybe that's where the water came from and added this veneer of water on the outside of our planet. The problem with that is as we investigated comets more and actually visited several with spacecraft and brought back samples, which I think is a pretty cool thing to be able to do, uh, we've been able to do chemical analysis on these objects and it turns out their water is chemically different than the water in Earth's oceans, which means that they couldn't have been the supply source for Earth's ocean water. So the question then, well, where did the water come from if not from comets? Well, the preferred explanation today is a variation of the late veneer hypothesis that asteroids are the source of Earth's water instead of comets. Uh, the problem is, of course, an asteroid typically doesn't contain much water. They're big rocks in space. Uh, and even the ones that do contain water, it turns out, also have some chemical differences with Earth's water. There's also a more dynamic problem here in that if you're going to propose that the early Earth was bombarded with large amounts of asteroids, that's a very destructive process, as you can imagine. Even if the Earth had some water accumulated on it, subsequent asteroid collisions would then vaporize a lot of that water. Uh, when you have an asteroid coming in from space and it can impact with the equivalence of several million nuclear weapons all at once, is that going to preserve water or is that going to 
vaporize and remove whatever water was there when it hit. We have a planet that's covered with water to the point of the ocean basins being miles deep in some places. I mean, there's entire ecosystems that survive in the oceans. This is a very dynamic and very life-supportive environment, yet the secular model would imply that none of this should be here. Other things about the Earth we could talk about. Our planet has a protective magnetosphere, a magnetic uh, field surrounding it. And this protects us from radiation from space, from the sun and from other sources. And we see the effects of this in the auroras, for example, but it has practical implications as well. A, it protects life, as we just said. Um, B, it's helpful to humanity in that we've been able to use this for navigation. And not only humans, by the way, even some animals use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate. I mean, there are birds that can migrate across the ocean with no visible landmarks for a long period of time. Apparently, they're using the magnetic field to navigate, which I think is pretty interesting. From an origins perspective, what is the source of this magnetic field? Where did it come from? Well, there's a couple different ways you can have a magnetic field on a planet. Now, one is primordial magnetism, which is left over from its formation. But a secular scientist believes the Earth is billions of years old, and primordial magnetism will decay over time and go away. So if you believe in the billions of years, you can't accept primordial magnetism. Your only other option, therefore, is what's called a dynamo, which is an old word that means electrical generator, that says the Earth is continually generating and regenerating its magnetic field over time. There are problems with that view, though. It's the only possible source for magnetic field over billions of years, but the problem is it doesn't actually work even under those circumstances. This is a famous problem in geodynamics. They've been trying to model how a dynamo could possibly last for billions of years, and it turns out that it can't. It's going, it too will decay over time. Now, if the Earth is just thousands of years old, it's not a problem. The magnetic field was created with the Earth, and it can last for thousands of years, certainly. Billions of years, though, is an issue. As this scientist pointed out, the problem is a serious one. We do not understand how the Earth's magnetic field has lasted for billions of years. We know that the Earth has had a magnetic field for most of its history. We don't know how the Earth did that. So they're at least being very honest about this issue. Not only uh, is this an issue of the fact that it still exists, by the way, there's also the fact that apparently within Earth's history, there have been polarity reversals within the magnetic field, where the north and south magnetic poles have swapped. Now, if they were coming from a dynamo, which the billions of year model requires, polarity reversals are a real challenge. Getting them to happen at all is difficult. And if they do happen, they would have to happen very slowly. However, there's evidence that some of these reversals have happened very quickly in Earth's history. We could tell that by looking at the rocks or looking, looking at, at the rocks, because when a, a rock cools from hot, from lava down to solid, the magnetic field at that time is imprinted on it, so to speak. And there are formations we've seen that have the magnetic field imprinted going basically in different directions, but it's a small enough formation that we know this would have taken maybe weeks or months to cool down. Wow, so, so pretty rapid reversal. Very rapid reversal, which doesn't match the billions of years time frame. And beyond that even, it turns out our magnetic field is decaying over time. Its dipolar strength is going down. This has been known since the 1800s, and it turns out that it has a half-life of about 1,400 years. So half-life means that in that period of time, it loses half of its strength. So looking backwards in time then, from now back in history, 1,400 years ago, roughly 600-ish AD, the magnetic field would have been twice as strong as it is today. So looking back in history, it would have been much, much stronger in the past. Looking forward in time, it's still going down, and predictions at the current rate, the, the dipole strength will diminish to zero in about 1900, year, 1900 years from now which is a fairly short period of time. Um, but I want to focus more on, on the, the past of this, because this actually can serve as a clock of how old the magnetic field and, by implication, the Earth itself are. Why is that? Well, if the Earth's magnetic field is coming from a dynamo, as the secular scientists want, then it's related to the amount of heat inside the Earth, because that's what's driving this overall process. Looking backward in history, the magnetic field would be stronger and the heat would be more intense. Is there a limit to how far back you can go, even doing this mental exercise? And the answer is yes. At a certain heat, the Earth's crust would melt. Now, it didn't do that, so that kind of sets a maximum. And when you do the numbers here, it turns out the maximum age of the overall system would be less than 20,000 years. Dinosaurs are long gone by this oh, time. Oh, everything, yeah. This would be yeah, so. uninhabitable for sure. And since the Earth was never in that condition, that would indicate it's younger than that. So again, younger than 20,000 years, which matches our viewpoint perfectly fine. Absolutely. Doesn't match the secular long age view, however. 
Other aspects of our Earth, you can argue, as I'm going to, <laughs> that our planet is uniquely designed for life because there's a lot of aspects to it that are quite finely tuned, even in ways that we might not necessarily appreciate because we just kind of take them for granted. And so I'm going to go up to the screen to talk about this a little bit more. So we can start by talking about our rotation period. So the Earth rotates on its axis once every 24 hours. Now we kind of just take that for granted, right? I mean, how many people wake up in the morning thanking the Lord that the day is 24 hours long? We don't think about this. We just assume that that's how it is. Now, it turns out that 24 hours is a really good period for the length of a day because it means you're rotating into the sun's energy for a while and then you're away from it for a while, so it keeps temperatures fairly stable. But it's not some inevitable kind of number. Again, we take it for granted, but we really shouldn't. Even within our solar system, we see a wide variety of values for this particular number. For example, Jupiter rotates all the way around on its axis once every 10 hours. And imagine an object this big rotating that quickly. I mean, you see the great red spot here, that's roughly the size of the Earth. <laughs> so a body this large rotating that quickly is pretty impressive. The opposite extreme, we have the planet Venus, which takes 243 Earth days to rotate on its axis once. So imagine if we had a day like that, we would be baking in the sun for 200 plus days and then freezing for 200. And That's a lot of sunscreen. That's a, <laughs> a lot, lot of it. sunscreen. So life here would be very difficult at best. And again, 24 hours appears to be this just right Goldilocks kind of value, and that's what the Earth has. Our axial tilt, the Earth is tilted over on its axis by 23 and a half degrees. And this is what gives us our seasons. Because at one time of the year, the northern hemisphere is toward the sun, so we have summer. Uh, six months later, we're on the opposite side, so the southern hemisphere gets more exposure. And so they have their summer, we have our winter. So our axial tilt is responsible for our seasons. And again, 23 and a half degrees is a really good value for a planet to have. It gives us moderate seasons, but again, that's not some kind of inevitable thing. We look at other planets and we see very different numbers, things that we could have had if the Earth weren't so well designed. For example, Mercury has basically no axial tilt, so there's no seasons on Mercury, which means the equ equatorial regions would always be very hot if the Earth were like this, and the polar regions would always be very cold. So less conducive to life in a situation like that. The other end of the spectrum is Uranus, which is almost 98 degrees. It's basically tilted over on its side and rolling along sideways like a ball instead of spinning like a top. So if the Earth were like this, we'd have the North Pole pointed at the sun for months at a time, so the southern, pole, the southern half of the planet would be freezing, and vice versa six months later. Again, very difficult for life. But our planet doesn't have these extremes. We have this moderate tilt, which produces moderate seasons and is very good for us. We have a very circular orbit. The Earth changes its distance to the sun very little over the course of our year. Again, we don't think about this, we just take it for granted, but it's not inevitable. There's other ways it could have been. For example, the planet Mercury has a more elliptical orbit. It receives twice as much radiation from the sun at its closest point as it does at its farthest point. So if we had an orbit like this, I mean, imagine receiving twice as much energy from the sun at one point, then six months later, receiving only half of that amount. I mean, you talk about climate change, <laughs> right? But no, the Earth doesn't have this. The Earth has a nice circular orbit, gives us even seasons. Our atmosphere, as you can see, is fairly thin. It's roughly the same thickness as like the skin of a peach, for example, relative to the Earth itself. Now, this turns out to be another Goldilocks kind of value. It's just right. If it were thinner, then we would be exposed to more radiation from space because the atmosphere helps us for that. Um, and of course, we need oxygen to breathe. There'd be less of that available, less partial pressure and so on. But if it were thicker, that would present problems of a different kind. So again, looking elsewhere in the solar system, we see Venus, which has a thicker atmosphere and a different composition than Earth. It has a runaway greenhouse effect. So if the Earth's atmosphere were more like Venus's, we might see some of the extreme conditions that Venus has, for example, the atmospheric pressure on Venus is over 90 times that of Earth. Its surface temperature, because it traps the sun's heat in this greenhouse effect, is almost 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So don't go vacationing on Venus. <laughs> if, you could, if you could survive the crushing pressure, you'd die from the heat anyway. Uh, it wouldn't even live long enough to die from the sulfuric acid that's in the air. So very unpleasant place. But this is our sister planet, very similar to Earth in its size, mass, position in the solar system, and so on, yet very different in the resulting environment. Because our atmosphere is not like Venus's, it's 
designed to support life. And then on the opposite end of the atmospheric extreme, we see Mars, which a very, with a very thinner atmosphere, so thin that it can't even retain liquid water, which of course we, we talked about on Earth being so important and so conducive to light, life. Mars is a desert planet primarily because of the atmosphere being thin. So again, we go about our daily business, we breathe the air, we don't think about how wonderfully finely tuned and well balanced our atmosphere is for us. The Earth also has a moon. It turns out the moon supports life on Earth in multiple ways. The one I'll focus on here today is the fact that its orbit around the Earth stabilizes the Earth's axial tilt. At, without the moon there, the Earth would be liable to precessing it and wobbling, if you will, over long periods of time. Now, from a creation perspective, there hasn't been long enough for this to be an issue anyway. But if you do think in terms of billions of years, then even then you'd have to concede that this is a good feature for supporting life on our planet. There's also evidence that the system is finely tuned in a different way. The moon has a unique combination of its size, orbit, and distance from the Earth that makes it able to produce a solar eclipse for us here on Earth. So every once in a while, when everything lines up correctly, the moon will pass in between the Earth and the sun. And the, the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun is, but it's 400 times closer to us than the sun is, which means that from our perspective, the disks of both are the same, and that makes these possible. A lot of things have to line up just right for that to be possible. Looking at other aspects of the Earth, our position in the solar system, we're here in the inner solar system in the terrestrial planets, there's other giant planets out here. Is this just some random thing? Well, no, this actually turns out to be very good for us. Number one, we're in the habitable zone, this, the narrow range of distances from the sun where liquid water is possible. Again, we talked about how important water is. We also see that by being inside of the orbit of Jupiter, we are protected from a lot of nasty things that might otherwise hit us from space. Jupiter is so large and massive that its gravity pulls in a lot of potential impactors that otherwise could strike the Earth. Now, this is just an artist's conception showing the idea, but this is uh, not just a hypothetical thing. We have seen Jupiter receiving things, uh, impacts in the past. Like, for example, this is actually a temporary scar that was left by fragments of the Shoemaker-Levy comet hitting Jupiter. Now, that one necessarily wouldn't, wouldn't have hit us, but in general, the idea of Jupiter being kind of a solar system vacuum and pulling things toward itself and thus protecting the Earth from potential bad things happening from uh, coming to us from space. Now, there's much more that can be said about this. I'm showing you here a book written by secular authors entirely on this one subject of how unusual and rare the Earth is and all these different elements that have to line up in order to support life here. Spike, this is really fascinating, but we have to take a break. Stay with us. You don't want to miss what's next. Hope you're enjoying Origins TV. It all started at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been producing new episodes for over 37 years now. We praise God for the success of the program and are excited to introduce you to Origins and to us. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Origins, you can find them on our YouTube page. Simply go to YouTube and search Cornerstone Television Network. Click the like and subscribe buttons, then you'll find the best episodes of Origins in our playlist. You can also visit our website at ctvn.org slash origins. One more way you can stay connected with us is to subscribe to our free monthly Hope Today newsletter, which you can do from our website. And if you have any questions, call us here at Cornerstone Television at 888-665-4483. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Spike Pissaris, who's been sharing about our designed Earth. You know, Spike, you've shown us a variety of finely tuned features about our world, apart from which life as we know it would not exist. And yes. all of them have to be there. Right. How do the secularists uh, square that with the astronomical uh, you know, likelihood that one of these things is not going to be there if it's all random? 
Right, that's one of the reasons I think this topic is so interesting because none of this is surprising from our perspective, of course. And right before the break, I had shown on a screen this book here written by two non-creationary astronomers trying to talk about all of the unusual features the Earth has and why we can expect it to be rare. Even if you don't want to acknowledge God in your thinking, you still have to say, hey, all of this stuff appears to be so finely tuned and so unusual in its combination of characteristics that, you know, what are you going to do with that? And incidentally, some of these issues have gotten worse lately as we're discovering planets in other solar systems. Initially, it was thought that if you get a solar system from the cloud of gas, that's just the result of natural processes. And you're going to wind up with ours, where there's rocky planets close and then there's giants out uh, farther out. The ones we're seeing elsewhere in the cosmos are not like that. We're seeing Jupiter-sized planets orbiting closely, more closely to its star than the Mercury does with our sun. We're seeing giant planets being ripped apart by radiation from the stars are orbiting. All these spectacular things, but point is, our solar system is very unusual in its configuration. Jupiter itself, you need a Jupiter in the solar system like we talked about to protect the Earth from uh, potential impactors coming in from the outside, but it can't be too close to the Earth and it can't be too far, it has to be just right. It has to be this Goldilocks value. And from the secular viewpoint, there's a long list of factors that has to be present on the Earth itself to have life be ideal here. It has to be close enough, yet still far enough away for complex life to be possible. You have to have the right mass of the sun. Uh, larger stars can burn more quickly and burn out more quickly. So even from the billions of years viewpoint, wouldn't be around necessarily long enough for life to develop on the planets. You can't have too much ultraviolet radiation. Orbits in the solar system have to be stable over long periods of time. If you want to believe in the billions of years, then you can't have planets smashing into each other uh, over those time frames. The planet that life develops on has to have the right mass to retain an atmosphere in the ocean. You need to have plate tectonics. Even from the evolutionary view, they need plate tectonics to be part of the development of life. So you need a solid molten core. You need a magnetic field to protect uh, life and retain the atmosphere from the solar wind. You need an ocean, not too little water, but also not too much. You need a large moon to stabilize the Earth on its uh, axial rotation, as we mentioned. It also has to be at the right distance, because too close to the Earth means destructive tides are raised. Too far away, the tides aren't enough to keep ocean water circulating. It'll become stagnant. One of the issues with an ice age, from a secular perspective, is that it, if, as glaciers form on the Earth, its albedo increases. And the albedo is the amount of sunlight reflected back into space. So when you have too much ice on the Earth, more sunlight is reflected back into space, so the Earth gets colder, and that can be a runaway effect. So you think once that starts, it should just keep going. What stopped right. it? What reversed it? Now, the creation perspective shows how we came out of the Ice Age, which was after the flood, because of the unique, character, the unique events going on at that time. Um, since we understand that a flood happened, we have mechanisms that both produced the Ice Age and got us out of it afterward. The secular scientists, of course, don't accept that, so they're a pro they have a problem of A, explaining how the Ice Age happened in the first place, and B, once it's in one, how do you get out? Yeah, how do you get this unique catastrophe that doesn't repeat itself or continue to happen in well, the uniformitarian way, right? Yeah, uh, their perspective, most of them would actually accept multiple Ice Ages now, which really kind of compounds the problem. If you can't get out of one, how do you get out of multiple? <laughs> um, then they have to grapple with things like the Cambrian explosion. From their perspective, that was very important in the evolution of, of life. But even taking on their worldview, they have to say that this one event was very important where all these different kinds of creatures all sprang into the fossil record all at once. For what reason? What was the mechanism for that? This doesn't match their, their worldview. The last one I have on the list here is the faint young sun paradox. The sun has been getting brighter over time. If you believe it's billions of years old, then it should slowly be getting brighter over time just from physics and how, how this all works. That means that earlier in Earth's history, the sun was producing a lot less energy and warmth for life on Earth. So you have the question of how was, was life able to develop here if we were receiving somewhere around 30% less energy from the sun at that time. So they have to believe in this long series of coincidences to s explain how all of this is possible within their way of looking at things. I almost feel bad for them. <laughs> <laughs> It requires some mental gymnastics, um, but as we've seen, they're committed to their worldview, and so that's the situation that they wind up being in. As you've mentioned, there's much more that could be said about this whole issue, but just the overall question is, does all of this look like the result of random natural processes over time? Or is it more sensical to say, if it looks designed, it probably is. And of course, we know from the Bible who the designer is that did all this. 
As scripture says, for thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it and created it not in vain. He created it, he formed it to be what? Inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So if an omniscient, omnipotent and benevolent creator made the earth and the moon and the sun and everything else to support life here on earth, then we shouldn't be surprised that it's very well designed to do that. So that's why we have entitled this presentation, Our Designed Earth. Not only is it wonderfully made to support life here and humanity in various aspects, it shows evidence of design. I don't think it's reasonable to say that oh, this fantastic list of all these aspects that have to be exact, or at least within narrow ranges, enough to fill an entire book, as we saw, that this is just a result of random processes. It makes more sense to me to say that our Earth is designed. And how gracious of him to let us, as you said earlier, discover it. Yes. That we can see it with our knowledge and see these other examples of, wow, this doesn't happen. Thank you for joining us, Spike. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us. On today's program, we looked at the many finely tuned features of our planet that uniquely allow for life as we know it to exist. In many cases, if even one of these things were slightly different, the Earth would not be able to support life. Random chance processes cannot produce order and design, but our God can. It just goes to show you once again that we know what the Bible says is true, and the proof is all around you. If you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to keep this creation television program on the air. Your support, both prayerfully and financially, make a big impact. So let's work together to reveal how awesome our Creator truly is, and we'll see you next time right here on Origins. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 2405, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.